Good morning. Welcome to Hollywood Church. This is our first attempt at doing a virtual learning experience. Um, we have had uh, someone who came to our church this past Sunday who had COVID. And because that person uh, got sick, we are trying to be extra careful. So we canceled out our services today and are going to do a Bible study for you with a, a remote, from remote learning. It's a little bit harder to do that because number one, I, as a teacher, I draw off of the energy that I feel with you all being here. And so when you're not here, I'm having to imagine what you look like. So that kind of gives me an advantage and it gives you a disadvantage. So I get to choose what you look like and you get to uh, hopefully enjoy the Bible study. We're gonna make it the best we can. You should be uh, right now actually up to about the middle of Joshua in the Old Testament. You should be in the Gospel of Luke by now, reading that. It's, uh, you're making progress. Uh, it, it, today is, what is that, the 28th day? How many days has it been? Do you remember? Well, whatever day it is, just think of it like this. Whatever day it is, you will have completed today at 28% or 20 nine percent of the entire Bible so every day you read you're getting one percent so every day you read you're getting closer to the goal you have to think of it in terms of life mileage if you're heading on a trip somewhere it's a hundred mile trip and it seems like it's slow and long and you're walking or riding a bicycle or something you just check off the miles and you know how much farther you got to go and generally speaking that's what's going on here so we're going to begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, please open up our eyes to behold wondrous things in your law. Make it so that we can grow and learn and become stronger Christians. Give us, give us not only knowledge, but give us uh, wisdom, the wisdom that goes along with the knowledge. Help us to make right application to the Bible uh, in our day-to-day -day living. In the name of Jesus, amen. So I want to begin with uh, just a couple of very basic things. As we have been in the book of Leviticus, the whole idea is that God's holiness is being demonstrated in many ways. Some of the laws that he gives, for example, you can tell that he is uh, quite serious about purity, holiness, about dealing with disease and things that are, that are uncommon, things that are not as they should be. He is always drawing a distinction between the common and the profane, and he draws a distinction between those and the holy and the, uh, and the clean. So you're going to find all throughout the book of Leviticus this back and forth about clean and unclean. Uh, it's, a, it's a story that uh, doesn't take that much time uh, to compile, in other words, when God put together the book of Leviticus for, the, for Moses, it was less than a month. It didn't take long at all. And it became the, uh, it became the actual uh, worship manual. Basically, it was intended to be used as a step-by-step -step direction like a cookbook that would help them to know how they were to conduct the affairs when the offerings were brought, when feast days came, and so forth. It's called Leviticus because it is the, tri the Levite tribes. Uh, the Leviticus is the, uh, as the, at the root of it, and these are what we call Levirate, Levirate laws or uh, Levitical laws because they have to do with the duties of the priests. Now, we haven't said much about this, but of course Aaron was the high priest, and Aaron had some sons, and so that would be one of the one of the first group, the first group of the uh, Levites. The second we had, of course, the Merari, and uh, and so we call those descendants the Merarites, and so they were a priestly tribe of Levi. And they had responsibilities that were given for them in the care of the tabernacle. So we're going to talk some about how God put them in place and how God had them accounted for and how he gave them particular duties. Thirdly, there was Kohath. And 
Kohath had, uh, they became Kohathites. Um, and so Kohath was uh, another one of the sons of Levi, and his responsibilities were to take care of those things in the tabernacle that could not be mobily transferred, meaning the Kohathites had to take those parts of the furniture that were not supposed to be touched uh, except by the hands of the Levites. So they had a very special duty, a very special job. And fourthly, that was Gershon. And Gershon was, uh, as you can just imagine, just followed down with the Gershonites. And these were the four different sons of Levi who had the duties of the tabernacle and the duties of the worship in the book of Leviticus. Again, that whole book of Leviticus has to do with what Aaron was supposed to do, uh, the Merorites, the Kohathites, the Gershonites, where they were to be in the camp and uh, how they would conduct themselves. Now, uh, when you read the book of Leviticus, it's really not that complicated a book. It's just a boring and difficult book. And I mean no disrespect when I say that. But basically the book is rather comprehensible when you look at it from a distance. It's when you start getting close to it and you are focused on it so much that it gets to be a little bit harder. Let me explain what I mean. In the first, in the first six or seven chapters, uh, you've got the, the, the sacrifices. So I'm going to really make this very easy. And those sacrifices are five. Uh, three, four, five. The burnt, and lest you should think that this was, uh, you know, like just the carelessness of burning something up. This was intended to create an awful odor, just like burnt food does. It was intended to make people see that sin stank. And so the burnt offering, the meal or the grain offering, and that would genuinely have been something like a uh, hoe cake cornbread. I don't mean that bad, but that's basically what it was. It's mixed with oil. You can take a look at it. It was, uh, it was a part of the offering. And the, and the worshiper would get to participate in some of these things. It was almost like a time of communion with the priests and, and entering into a relationship with the priest as the worshipers came. So the burnt, the meal, uh, the sin and the trespass, and the guilt. Yeah, so these are the offerings. And then, of course, there are different animals that are associated with what could be brought in each one of them. You know, they, they made differences. They made allowances for those who were poor, who didn't have the, uh, the wherewithal, the means to be able to provide for uh, the more expensive or costly kinds of sacrifices, but they certainly were not to be excluded from the worship service. Obviously, God intended for everyone to come before him in worship. And he said to them three times in these books that we are reading that we call the first five books of the Bible, the Torah or the Pentateuch, Penta meaning five, Pentateuch, these first five books of the Bible, God required at least three times of them do not appear me before me empty-handed. And so what happened was these, these uh, five sacrifices that were in the first few chapters of uh, the book of Leviticus had all of the details of what the worshiper was supposed to do and what the priest was supposed to do. Now I'm going to take you just to, for a minute over to a side view of what the tabernacle looked like. I almost always draw it wrong, so I'm going to be... I draw it wrong, and I'll tell you how I draw it wrong. I usually have it facing west, and that is not accurate. It was the, the tabernacle always faced east. So that means that the opening of the tabernacle would have been on this eastern side. And, of course, that within that tabernacle, there was a tent itself that was, um, that was rather uh, square in the back part, but this was... This was the area where the brass altar was. It would have been simply a large grill-type structure where a fire was continually burning, so the smell of smoke, smoke always rising up. But this is where the worshipers would come with these different offerings. 
And so you could just imagine it being out here and, uh, and meeting with the, uh, with the priest and bringing their offerings. And, you know, one of the things that they would do would be to, uh, to kill the, to slay the animal and the priest would take the knife and cut it into the neck of the animal and, uh, and put it up on the grill or on that laver, I mean, excuse me, that, uh, that brazen uh, altar. And uh, the worshiper would watch, they would watch the burning and they would recognize that this was intended to convey something about their sin that ought to cause them to dread sin. It was a hard thing to witness. The priest also had beyond that a little place back here that was like a laver. I'm going to draw a sort of a side view of it. And I'm not a good artist, and I recognize that. And I know you're saying, I'm glad you recognize it. But I am trying. So it was just a, a little place where um, the, the water could be, feet could be washed in here, hands could be washed in here. So maybe I hate to be again... Uh, you know, disrespectful, and I'm not. But it's sort of like a bird bath, perhaps, except larger, and a place at the bottom where the priest could wash their feet. This was a curtain, very strong curtain, and inside the curtain there were two things. There was a table that contained bread, and we call that showbread, or S-H-E-W is the way it's spelled in the old version of the Bible. But on that there were loaves of bread that were placed, and those were for the priests, when they came in, and also there was the golden candlestick, and the golden candlestick uh, was left to burn. It burned with oil all the time. And then right at the entrance here, there was another altar, and that altar was the altar of incense. And the purpose of the altar of incense was as the worshiper is moving toward God, you go from the burnt smell of the stench of the sin having been dealt with to cleansing, to communion, to enlightenment, to prayer, and into the presence of God. For this is where the Ark of the Covenant was. So this is really a picture of how worship really takes place. So I want to explain that to you just a little bit from the perspective of um, us, okay? So we, we recognize that we have different needs in our life. Let's just say that there are times when we know we have violated God's law. There are times when we have guilt, feel guilt, or weighed down with guilt. And so what do you do? You know, a lot of people feel like we should run, <laughs> don't go to church, because I am not worthy to be at church. That's, you know, I've committed, I've committed sins. I've, you know, I've trespassed God's law. I feel terribly guilty, and I don't... I don't know, I just need to isolate myself. This is exactly what you are not supposed to do. If you'll look at these things, these sacrifices are to remind you of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. He became all that you need so that you can enter into the presence of God. He becomes the one who is slaughtered for you. He becomes the one who suffered for you, who died for you. The people who would bring those offerings would place their hand on the offerings and they would pray over it as, as if there was a transference of guilt, a transference of trespasses, a transference of sin, and all of that onto that animal. And then they would watch it as it was slaughtered and as it was apportioned. And then the priest would act at this point as a mediator, a go-between between, between the worshiper over here and God back here. And he would act on behalf of the worshiper by going in closer for cleansing. It's a picture of our sanctification. We need to grow in sanctification and grace so that we can become uh, closer to the Lord. And we also grow in sanctification, not just from cleansing, but from the communion that we have with God as we spend time with the Lord, as we, uh, as we taste and see that the Lord is good, as it says in Psalm 34. So these are the things that we do. We feast upon the bread. We feast upon God's goodness and we begin to enjoy a relational experience with it. We also turn to the light, which is the Word of God, which is the Holy Spirit. As the priest, the high priest, would go in and act on behalf of the people, he would have two little stones that he carried inside of his little breast pocket uh, that he wore on his uh, robe right beneath, the, right beneath the breastplate. This Urim and Thummim were two stones that were used to help him to make decisions. 
And oftentimes he would go into this area and he would take these two stones and it, one of them uh, uh, had to do with light. In other words, it, Lord, give me light. Let me see what your will is. The other one, the thummim, had to do with uh, his conviction, his feeling. And that, that could only come from integrity. In other words, in his integrity of his heart, and the word thummim is a plural for a Hebrew word that means integrity. So in the integrity of his heart, with the light of the word of God, while he was in relationship with the Lord, after he had been cleansed, after he had made his offering, he could make the decisions that he needed to make. And then, of course, this was the place where uh, the high priest would go on Yom Kippur uh, to observe the Day of Atonement. We just passed that date on September the 16th, uh, the Day of Atonement. Kippur means atonement, and the priest would walk into the, into the area of the holy place and sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. The mercy seat would have been, if this was the Ark of the Covenant, it was a box like this. It had a seraphim or cherubim, one on one end and one on the other. And this little area right in between them where it was the contents of the box. There were three things in that box according to Hebrews chapter 9. Uh, but this area right here was called the mercy seat. And the mercy seat was where the blood was applied. And the blood was applied there because it would cover it would cover over the people's sins so that God did not see those three things in that box which represented sin. Those three things were a pot of manna. Uh, the second thing was Aaron's rod that budded. And the third thing was the tables of stone that Moses received from the Ten Commandments. And so... On Yom Kippur, which is talked about in Leviticus chapter, I think it's 16, 16 or 17, uh, they would cover over the people's sins for a year. The manna was there to show a rejection of God's provision, of God's kindness, of God's faithfulness, and how the people mistreated his kindness and, and did not uh, appreciate it. For example, they... We read in the book of Numbers in the 10th and 11th chapters, the 11th chapter, you'll find where there was a, a revolt against the man and they beat it and they fried it and they just said our soul hates this stuff. So the man of it became a picture of their rebellion or rejection of God's kindness. The, the rod that budded is the story that's developed later on in the rebellion of Korah. You'll read about that in the book of Numbers. If you haven't got there yet, I hope you're... I hope you're there, but you know, when you get to it, you'll read about a man named Korah. And Korah complained that uh, it wasn't fair that Moses and Aaron would have all of the higher positions in the priesthood. And so he began to challenge them. Uh, and as he did, God said, well, I want to show you who I want to be my representative, my priest. And so he had each one of the leaders to take their uh, symbols of authority, which were the rod that they used, that they carried with them everywhere. On that rod were written many things about their family, family members. When they were born, it was carved into the wood. It became a very important uh, family uh, heirloom. And uh, it would have important dates or just uh, other things there. So these 12 leaders, the 12 tribes, uh, all of them went in to take, uh, as God had told them, this symbol of authority and symbol of leadership, and they placed it into the floor of the tabernacle in here, and they left it overnight. And the next morning when they went to go to retrieve them, they found that Aaron's rod had distinguished itself from all the others because it began to sprout and to have leaves on it. And it also had almonds on it. So that means that a dead stick began to produce fruit. And that was a picture of the resurrection. And so, um, you know, because God takes that which is dead and brings forth life. This is a picture of Jesus Christ. 
He was God's appointed priest. And he was rejected. He was questioned. He was play, you know, set aside in darkness for a while. But look, as he came forth out of the grave, he brought forth first fruits. So Aaron's rod was inside of that box. But this represented a picture of the rejection of God's leadership, God's provision, God's leadership. And this, of course, the tables of stone would have been just a representation of the violation of God's law. Because the people, when they were at Mount Sinai, they began to make these bodacious and bold claims that they would observe everything that God told them to do. And uh, even while Moses was still up on the mountain, the people in the valley grew weary and tired of waiting for Moses to come down and entered into idolatry. We read about that in, uh, in Exodus chapter 32. We read about their rebellion throughout the book. So they, they thought they could embrace God's law and, and do everything required of them, but oh, they were so wrong. Now, that's not a bad thing, though, because seeing that is necessary to appreciate the gospel. But God wanted them to know about how uh, atonement worked and covering worked and the blood would work. Now, these are beautiful pictures of what happens in the ministry of Jesus except for one thing. Uh, the blood of Jesus Christ does not cover our sin. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So, whereas you might consider that when on Yom Kippur, as beautiful as that day was, when the blood of the sacrificial animal was put over top of that, it would cover over so God would not look upon the sins of the people, but the sins were still there. But the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus just takes those things away. And it is almost like there's another part of this that we don't talk about related to these offerings. When these offerings were brought by the worshiper, they would oftentimes bring two animals instead of one. One would be slaughtered, one would be thrown up on the grill, the brazen altar, so that it would be sacrificed. And then the worshiper would place his or her hands on top of that animal, the second animal, and confess his or her sins. And then the priest would lead that animal out into the wilderness and let it go. That became known as the scapegoat. And that's where we use the word scapegoat now, by the way. And what happens is with that, the scapegoat is the, uh, is the reminder that the Lord takes our sins and deals with them at the cross, but he also takes them far away from us, as far as the east is from the west, the Bible says in Psalm 103, that God says, I will remember your sins no more. And he gets rid of all of our sins. He disposes of them. So we have these five sacrifices. And then after that, in relation to all of this in the book of Leviticus, we get to chapter 8 through 10. And what we have is this, the, the priests and how they were to adorn themselves. So we have the dress of the high priest and what he was supposed to look like. So I'm going to erase this about the five sacrifices. I'm going to talk real quickly about the priests, and we'll move on into the other part of the book, and then we're going to go to numbers. But let me show you how all of this worked. The priest, uh, the high priest was, uh, first of all, he was chosen by God. Uh, that's one thing that Korah didn't understand, that, you know, God chooses whom he cho chooses those whom he chooses, according to Romans chapter 9. And so his choices sometimes don't include others. And so Korah was bothered by that, but he was chosen by God. He was set apart or consecrated by God. After he was set apart and consecrated, he was cleansed. He went through a ritual cleansing. After he was cleansed, he was clothed, which means that he put on the priestly garments that had been given to him or made for him by the by the seamstresses and the gifted people within the, the camp. And then after that, he was uh, crowned and given a mitre. And then after that, there was the anointing. So all of these things meant that he was installed as the priest. So the priest is a picture of Jesus as well. For all of these things are true 
about Jesus Christ. He was the chosen Messiah. He was the chosen one. We even sing a song about him being the one who was chosen. He was consecrated, set apart at his baptism. And, and even we would say cleansed in the sense of ritual cleansing as he said, let me be baptized now because it fulfills all righteousness even though I have no sin. He didn't say it this way, but there are no sins to be cleansed. I want to fulfill all righteousness and do this uh, ceremonially. Uh, he was, uh, the Holy Spirit came upon him after the baptism. In Luke chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4, read that. The Spirit of God came upon him. And as the Spirit of God came upon him, while well, he was at that time tempted and tried and shown to be the perfect priest as he represented his people well in the, in the place of temptation. And then he was crowned and then anointed by the Holy Spirit for healing and to bring about changes in people's lives through the ministry of the power of the Holy Spirit as he went around and blessed people healing the sick everywhere that he went. So we read about these in the, in the first part of Leviticus. As we move on into the 11th chapter and following, it's a little bit different because we begin to deal with <clears throat> miscellaneous laws. And those kinds of laws to me are, are very difficult to read because we, we see God is quite picky about a lot of things. And I'm, I'm certainly not impugning God by saying that. I'm just saying that, you know, if your skin didn't look right, there was, you know, you had to deal with it. If you didn't have everything just right with your neighbor, you had to deal with it. You had to live in harmony with the people around you. You're supposed to do your worship. You're supposed to be watchful. You're supposed to observe the holy days. You're supposed to obey the law. I mean, there was a lot of, a lot of uh, requirements that were there. And so, uh, but these were all intended to help Israel to become the special and unique people that God wanted them to become so they would stand out among the nations. Now, they did not do that very well. But the successor to Israel was Jesus. In other words, Hosea, let's just listen now. Hosea 11, 1 through 3 tells us that when Israel was my son, talking about the nation of Israel, God said, I led it, I took it by the hands, and I taught it to walk. That's what he's talking about with all of this. He, I took it, took it by the hands, and I, and I led it and taught it how to walk. And then he goes on to say, but you know what? They rejected me. They rejected me. But then how can I give up Israel? I love Israel. God goes on in the 11th chapter with some of the most beautiful flowery language of, of love and grace that he had for his people. You can see the extraordinary commitment that he had. However, that Hosea 11 chapter, uh, 11th chapter, verses 1 through 3, is linked to, actually, Matthew chapter 2. And Matthew chapter 2 says that when Jesus was leaving Egypt, the same verse as he left Egypt, I took Israel by the hand and I led Israel out of Egypt. And it applies it to Jesus. So what I'm saying is, is that Israel itself is a type of Jesus. And Jesus is the fulfillment or the antitype, antitype, of the nation of Israel. So whereas the nation of Israel learned all of these things were wrong, they were all wrong, this had to be fixed, that had to be done, they needed to learn this, Jesus himself, in the perfections of his heart, obeyed all of those laws in the most perfect way so that he could satisfy God's expectations for all who were in him, all who trust him. So this is what we read about in the book of Leviticus. It's really hard reading, but it's about Jesus. And we read about such things in uh, chapter 10, 11, 12, and all of those little sections there where we have so many details. And then when we read about the part about leprosy as you go on uh, through the book until you get to the day of uh, Yom Kippur and so forth, and you coast eventually to chapter 23, and there you have the seven feasts. Those seven feasts are again 
important in the life of Israel. They were intended to be uh, what we would say retreats. They were intended to get the people away from their ordinary uh, service and to jolt them into a reality that they needed to pay attention to God. Would to the Lord we had that kind of an uh, understanding today, really. Because we don't have holy space or holy time anymore. Uh, it's, it's hard for people to take time for God. We, we justify all the time taking time for ourselves. Yeah, I need time for myself. I need time for me. I got to have some me time. I need to go to the beach. I need to just because I'm just so tired, blah, blah, blah. We're just always looking after, you know, me, me, me. But in those convocations, those different ceremonies that are set aside as feast days, they were intended to make time for God. And it started with the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day was intended to be a day that you focused on, concentrated on your relationship with God, that you didn't have other distractions. You didn't pay so much attention to your phone. You didn't pay attention to your, your other work duties and so forth. It was be still and know God. Well, the Sabbath, of course, uh, led into seven or six other different feasts. And uh, I could list those. I really could, but I'm not going to take the time to do it. I do want you to look at Passover. And I want you to look at the Feast of Unleavened Bread. I want you to think about the order of that. The order of Passover is always... Uh, you receive the meal first, and the meal was Jesus. That's the Passover lamb. You know, that was, that was you, you need Jesus. And then there's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And that's when you clean up. A lot of people think, well, I need to get ready to receive Jesus, so I need to clean myself up and get myself ready so that I can receive Jesus. It's the exact opposite. You receive Jesus, and then there is the cleansing that takes place. Of course, uh, after that, there's the Feast of the First Fruits, where the priest waves the sheaf uh, of the new harvest on the third day afterwards, uh, after the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and they're celebrating and beginning to uh, recognize that the harvest is coming. And so the priest does the first f uh, fruits, and then 50 days later, there's the Feast of Pentecost, and the Feast of Pentecost is the, the gathering in and the combining of the harvest all together. It's a picture of uh, the formation of God's people to be empowered by the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. We have the Feast of Trumpets, which is a picture of the time that God is calling His people to Himself. And then we have the Feast of uh, Tabernacles, which is called Sukkot, which is uh, the story of the children of Israel living in the tents, but it also has a broader... Uh, prophetic meaning as well about the time when God will dwell among his people. It's a perfect transition to take us into the book of Numbers because one of the things that God in giving the feast of Sukkot and in giving these different uh, feasts where he gathered his people together shows a very important principle. And that very important principle is that God wants to have his people around him, and he wants to be in their midst. I know that we have people who say, I can feel as close to God uh, when I am out fishing as I can in a church. That may be true, but the essence of it is God genu genuinely prefers to meet you in the presence of his people. Uh, he wants you to be there. So I'm going to draw just a little bit more so you can take a look at this time maybe a little bit better. This is the tabernacle, and I'm going to draw the actual tent on the inside here, and we'll leave a little spot for an opening there. This would be the Holy of Holies, and this would be the um, holy place, and... This would be the outer court. And, of course, you hopefully by now have remembered the things that were there. The grill, the laver, the lamp, and the table, and the Ark of the Covenant back here. 
So all of this was, uh, was pitched together and, and, uh, and that's where it stayed. And, and when the tabernacle was constructed, God sent down His glory in a cloud that was called the Shekinah glory, which was just sort of a hovering cloud that had a light brightness to it at night so that it glowed in the dark. And the people would be comforted in knowing that the, God's presence was there. And uh, it, was, uh, it was also the means through which God used visibly to say when it was time for the camp to move because the cloud would come up and the people would see it and watch it as it moved and they knew they were to follow the cloud. Now wouldn't that be a wonderful thing if we all could follow the Holy Spirit the way the children of Israel were supposed to follow that cloud. That is what is intended. Now I'm not going to draw exactly well, I could probably do it because I got these notes here. Hang on a second. I don't think I could do it from memory because uh, my memory is just not that good anymore. But uh, I do want to show you how that the, um, the people were arranged. Uh, first of all, let's talk about the ones who were here immediately, closest pitched their tents, closest to the interests of the tabernacle were Aaron and Aaron's sons, the high priest, and Moses. So these were, the, these were the, the chief gatekeepers, and they pitched their tent right near the entryway and made sure that that uh, was preserved. Now, this is a picture also of Jesus. In John chapter 10, Jesus talked about, I am the door of the sheep. And I don't know if you know this or not, but what he was talking about was he said the sheep would lay his life down. The sheep would actually lay down at the area where they were to be taken in uh, or out. And he would be the protector to make sure that no one or no animal could get in to get to the sheep without going over him or through him. And so Aaron and the sons and Moses became like a picture of Jesus as they were uh, guarding the holy things. Now, up here were the sons of Levi. We're going to just write their names. Merari pitched his, their tents. His folks were on this, uh, what would be the north side. And then on the west side, Gershon would have had his uh, family and his tribe. And then on the bottom, which is the south side, there would have been Kohath. And the Kohathites, again, were the ones who moved the materials that could not be transported by a wheel or wagon or whatever. So this is the first thing. God is in the middle of His people. He begins to put His people close to Him. He gives them each one jobs. This is another very important thing. In other words, you didn't just come for vacationing here. This is not to, if you're a priest, you're not just going to be just enjoying the food that's brought to you. You've got work to do, and you've got a place, and you've got a responsibility, and so that's the way it's supposed to be. Now, also, there was this other side to that, and this is where God put all 603,000 people around him in neat order, as they pitched their tents, and it was an awesome, magnificent sight. I want to talk to you about who was where. This is part of what's in the book of Numbers. Not only did they get counted, they also got uh, close to God. They were, they were counted, and they were close, and then uh, they were counseled by God. So over on this, uh, on this west side, we would have had Benjamin and Ephraim and Manasseh. Benjamin, the tribes of Benjamin, Ephraim, and Manasseh. Up here on the north side, we would have had Asher and Dan and Naphtali. Asher, Dan, and Naphtali. Now, if you take these and write them down in your book, your Bible, where you're reading, you'll see how these people, uh, if you count the numbers, it's very important. If you really want to do some more significant study, you'll see that there's a good apportionment of the number of people with the heavier concentration of people being here up front, which is a very important lesson because 
you send your strength forward. Goodness and mercy follow us all the days of our life and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's moving ahead that's the big thing. And that requires energy to move ahead. It's easy to sit still. It's easy to look back. Put your resources forward because as we say here in the, in the vision statement of our church, we are prayerfully moving forward together, sharing the heart of Christ. Our resources should be in our vision. I'm telling you that because it's going to be budget time before long, and we need to keep these things focused in our mind. So over here on this side would have been Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. Judah, the biggest tribe, Issachar, and uh, Zebulun. And of course, you know, Wendell was not a tribe, but it would have been along here. I'm just kidding. So anyway, sorry about that. So Gad, Reuben, and Simeon would have been down here. Gad, Reuben, and Simeon. Now, if you put all of these things together, what you've got is you've got this massive encampment. And it would have been an extraordinary thing with a cloud, funnel cloud sort of hovering right there in the middle, bringing light to the camp. And all of these people would have been in their places. Uh, and every day it would have rained manna around them. And they had quail coming into the camp where God could, would make sure that they had bread and meat to eat and were fed. And so the Lord was looking after his people. He was in the midst of his people. This is a beautiful little picture. And it rem should, you should see something in a Bible many times that helps you to appreciate this image. For example, in Psalm 46 and verse number 10 and some of the other places in the Bible. It talks about God is in the midst of her and therefore we will not fear, we will not faint, we will not fret because God is in the midst of her and there's a river that's running through the city of God and makes glad the people of God so the Lord's provision is there. So that's what we learn about in the book of Numbers as we see them first in the census. And that's what's happening in the first few chapters of Numbers. It is boring reading, but at least if you know what God's doing, you can, you can draw this little map out. You can write down how many people were from Asher and Dan and Naphtali, and it becomes a little bit more of a you know, study instead of just blasting through and reading it. Now, there are some other interesting things along the way in the book of Numbers. For example, there is a lie detector test that God gave to the, to the uh, priest to be able to use. If there was a suspicion of adultery, you would read about that. One of the worshipers would be taken uh, to the priest, and the priest would make a special concoction that came from the floor of the tabernacle, and the person who was thought to be guilty of adultery would drink it and have a reaction if they were guilty. And this is just because the chemistry in our bodies certainly changes when we lie and God knew that and so he made provision for helping a lie detector test that the uh, people of Israel could use uh, when they came for worship if one of them thought the spouse had been guilty. Unfortunately it was only designed for the women which shows what a patriarchal society it was but it was what it was and that happened. You also read about the Nazarite vow as you get into chapter 6 and 7 of Numbers. And I want you to remember that it's a Nazarite, it's not Nazarene. And you'll remember the most famous Nazarite would have been uh, Samson. And Samson was a very poor example of a Nazarite because if you look at the, the coverage, the things that should have been done in that sixth chapter of Numbers, you'll find that Samson violated just about every one of those things that were in his vow. And the secret of his strength was his, was the, his uh, commitment to his vow, and God still blessed him. But uh, you, you learn about the Nazarite vow. And when you get to the 10th chapter, or, or excuse me, the latter part of the 6th chapter of Numbers, you find the Aaronic benediction, where, uh, where it would be that the Aaron would bless the people. May the Lord bless you and keep you and lift up his countenance upon you, make his face shine upon you and give you peace. This blessedness that came from the priest as he ministered over the people of God at the ends of the day. <clears throat> and also Moses. 
whenever he would get ready to move and everything was ready, he would say, Rise up, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. There were certain rituals that, they, that came along with the camp as they called upon God to bless them and as they called upon God to help them and lead them. These are also instructive things. Now when you get to Numbers chapter 11, what you get to is a list of complaints. This is where everything begins to turn bad. And I'm going to put the word complaints up here, but I want to also put with it like taints. In other words, they were tainted by their complaints. So their complaining began to change the things that were going on in the camp. And, uh, and instead of there being peace and harmony, there began to break out some certain um, chastisements from God. So I want to mention just a few of these. I know the first one was when they began to complain about their uh, hardships. It doesn't say exactly what those hardships were, but uh, the thousands of people were destroyed because God sent a plague of fire to punish them. Uh, they began to complain in verse 4 about the lack of meat. Uh, they were coveting the things that they didn't have. And so God said, uh, I'm going to give it to you, but he became angry at their pettiness and the way they went about it. In chapter 14, after being stuck in the wilderness, facing the giants of the promised land, they wanted to go back. In other words, they went over from a place called Kadesh Barnea. And I want, we're going to come back to this in just a minute, but this was a very important time, Numbers 13 and Numbers 14, because it was there that the spies were sent over into the promised land and God had already told them that he would go ahead of them, that he would use hornets to drive out their enemies, that he was going to be with them, that they could defeat the enemy. All they had to do was to go and take the land. But instead of trusting God's word, they trusted what they saw and the interpretation of what they saw. And what they saw was, it's going to be too hard. It's going to be too hard. Instead of hearing, God is with us, God is with us. So they rejected God's word. And that is a very of offensive thing to God, the rejection of his word. So at this point, this open rebellion against God and his leaders led to them dying in the wilderness. So we're going to talk about 1.5 million people just as a guess dying over the next 40 years. Now, this is just an incredible uh, number. That, that means, truly, if at that moment that they rejected God at Kadesh Barnea, if God had said, we're going to start now, and we're going to see that every one of these people die before the 40 years is up, that would have meant that somebody would have had to have died around every 40 seconds for the next 40 years. There would have been continuous crying, continuous groaning and moaning and grieving and pain and agony and digging and burying people for 40 years. This was a terrible time in the wilderness. And it all started because they did not believe God's word. Now the writers in the New Testament talk about this at length when they go into the book of Hebrews, for example, the third chapter and the fourth chapter, it warns us that we have the same kind of a possibility if we reject God's word, if we don't move forward with God's word in faith and believe what he says and appropriate what he says and live as how he says that we too can be stuck where we are and not grow at all. And it is the chief thing, I believe, that's going on in churches today is that people just are not familiar with God's Word. They just are not believing God's Word. They just are not moving forward in faith. And that's what happened at Kadesh Barnea, the place where they sent over the 12 spies and the place where they began to lose all their momentum. In chapter 16, we begin to see the story of Korah and Dathan and Abiram as they caused a division against Moses and against Aaron because they were rejecting his leadership. This is the story where Aaron's rod comes out. But I would like to point out to you that these people, Korah and uh, Abiram uh, and uh, Dathan, 
they, they caused a division. And to show you how God has said you will reap what you sow, um, they sowed division. And so they reaped division because God divided the earth and the earth took them in. So the division took them in. It was a poetic justice in a way, but the death of these rebels came about uh, because of their, of their rejection of leadership um, and so forth. And people began to complain about Korah's death, which led to some more problems. So the division grew even after they were dead and God had to take some more people out. Division is like that. Once something starts tearing, it's hard to stop it. And I don't mean to be, you know, like uh, you know, too, too silly here with an illustration, but I am do tinkering around carpentry work. I'm not a good carpenter, but I do know one thing. If you ever drive a nail somewhere at the corner of a, of a piece of wood, you can easily split it. It's just the, the nature of it. You put the wood in and it just splits. If it splits it here, it's going to be easier for it to split all the way down everywhere else. And this is what division is like. And so God had to deal with that division by causing 14,700 people to be killed. God hates division. Read Proverbs chapter 6. God hates division. And then in chapter 20, uh, we have another complaint. So the complaints are about their, their plight. That's in the first part of chapter 11. Uh, it's about their lack of meat. Uh, and God takes care of that, but brings about... It's about their being stuck in the wilderness and not being able to go forward. It's about the leadership under these people. It's about the uh, authority thing. And then it's about the lack of water. And this one is very important because uh, Moses gets caught up in this. He finally gets angry in this chapter, chapter 20. And uh, Moses sinned along with the rest of the people when he took the rod, rod and hit the rock. Uh, just a word about that. I think a lot of people think God might have been harsh or something in not allowing Moses to go in. But there are a couple of things that you should know. Uh, number one, okay, between chapter 19 and chapter 20, there is a period of 37 years or so that takes place. So we don't have a record of a lot of the things that happened in the wilderness, only a few things. So by the time we get over to chapter 20, where this experience took place, we're down at the end of a long journey, and Moses is tired. He's not too far away from the promised land. Uh, and uh, he's just about reached the end of everybody dying off. And here these people are still complaining after all this time. You know everybody gets worn out after a period of time. I'm saying that about Moses. I feel sorry for him. But at the same time, he violated God's law and God was very severe. And uh, because Moses was a public figure, God showed that he would not spare him. Just because uh, he was in the public, it actually made his sin to have even more of a, uh, an egregious nature. All right, in chapter 21, uh, we have the story uh, that God and Moses, uh, well, the complaint that God and Moses uh, had brought them into the wilderness so that they would die. So they're just still complaining about the leadership and the lack of progress. Uh, and there, I'm just going to put lack of progress. And so all through it all, there was this grumbling and grumbling and grumbling that was going on. All these complaints, all these complaints eventually <clears throat> led to <clears throat> the book coming down to a slow crashing end. The book of Numbers takes place over a period of about 38 or so years. And uh, then we move into the book of Deuteronomy. And I'm going to give you just a few moments uh, to look at the book of Deuteronomy. So I'm going to erase this and remind you that at the end of the book of Numbers, uh, we have the second census that is taken. And the reason why it's taken is because by the time the book of Numbers ends, we have the uh, new generation of people 
coming up. These would be the, the men who were 20 years old and upwards who have been raised up to take the place of those who were 20 years old and upwards 40 years earlier. So that's a new generation. So Deuteronomy is the story, and I like to tell people that you can think of Deuteronomy like duet. Duet means two. Dut means two, and nam means law. So it's the second time that the law is given, Deuteronomy. And the second time it's given is the second time it's given in the book of Deuteronomy is because Moses is teaching it to the new generation of people who were not at Mount Sinai, but who've been wandering around in the wilderness with their uh, parents for so long. So when we get to the book of Deuteronomy, we have uh, Moses, a softer and gentler kind of a person explaining the law than the cold steel sort of presentation we have uh, in the book of Exodus. I want you to notice that as he gives the law, he gives a lot more explanation of it. Jesus quotes more from the book of Deuteronomy than from any other book in the, uh, in the Bible. Uh, there are a few things that stand out. First, the period of uh, time that it took to write uh, the book of Deuteronomy uh, was only about two months. It was two months. So when you read this book, you're going to think, wow, it took, this is a long time. But no, only two months to write it, but it was a rehearsal, a remembrance of all, of all the past 20 years. Or 40 years, all the past 40 years, including, uh, including uh, their exodus from Egypt. So it is a summary of what has gone on. It's a good way for the Pentateuch to end because it's retelling some of the things that happened. So as you enter into it, you're going to find that Moses is calling the people above all other things to learn how to be thankful. I do think one of the great chapters of Deuteronomy is the 8th chapter, because it is a recollection of how good God had been to them in providing for them so faithfully through the years. So Deuteronomy, Moses begins to give the second law. He explains and interprets the law. He gives a lot more detailed information about the law. And as you get into chapter 28 and 29, he has the people to get on two mountaintops that are near each other in what we call an antiphonal antiphonal uh, kind of a chorus and the people on one are calling out to the people on the other and they are speaking out blessings and if you obey God these things will happen or curses if you disobey God and these people are, are in, involved in not only hearing from Moses the second law but of seeing the consequences of violating God's law as they read through chapter 28, 29. And the 20, I mean, as they go through this whole list of, of, of uh, curses and blessings that are found in those chapters. Uh, chapters 32 through 34 are what we call the swan song of Moses. And the swan song it is a, it's called that because as you probably know, swans only sing one time in their life and their song is only as they go to prepare to die. Well, God told Moses to get ready that he was going to die. And so Moses composed a song that's in the chapters 32 through 34. Uh, Moses was a songwriter. He wrote, we know, Psalm 90, which is definitely a chapter that you ought to read in context with the book of Numbers. He probably wrote Psalm 91, although there is a question about it. And we know that he wrote other songs because we are told that in the book of Deuteronomy. But his swan song is his final song, his last act. And then when we get to the last chapter, we find that God buried Moses. And uh, the reason for that is Moses' body probably would have been revered beyond that which was ever intended by God. So the Lord took care of Moses Another thing about that is God does care enough about the body that he didn't just leave it. The Bible says God buried Moses. So, all right, that's it for today. I hope you've enjoyed.
this. God bless you. We'll see you next week.